Story 1. The Disappearance of Nicholas Barclay as Frederick Bourdain. In 1994 in San Antonio, Texas, 13-year-old Nicholas Barclay disappeared from his home. Three years later, Barclay was found huddled next to a phone booth halfway across the world in Linares, Spain. Authorities picked him up and reunited him with his family. However, certain things didn't add up. Barclay had very little memory of what happened to him and couldn't give the police a real answer as to how he ended up in Spain. Plus, his English was terrible, and when he did speak English, it was with a heavy accent. This doesn't make sense for someone who spent the first 13 years of his life in the United States, but these discrepancies were explained away by the fact that Barclay was probably just coping with the emotional trauma of being kidnapped to a foreign country and kept away from his family for three years. One thing no one could explain, though, was that when Nicholas returned to the United States, his eyes were a different color than when he originally disappeared. Barclay tried to resume a normal life, enrolling back into his old school, moving back in with his family, etc. About four months after reuniting with his family, a private investigator discovered that Nicholas Barclay wasn't Barclay, but a con artist named Frederick Bourdain. Bourdain was wanted by Interpol because he had a habit of stealing the identity of missing youths. Bourdain was arrested, but this brought about even more disturbing questions about Nicolet's disappearance. Nicolet was a very unruly and problematic child. He was always getting into trouble at school, and there were several police reports from his family's house about domestic disturbances and arguments that worsened in the months before he went missing. Nicholas's mom moved her brother into their house, Nicholas's uncle, shortly before he disappeared to help give Nicholas some structure. It is rumored that he couldn't handle Nicholas and instead killed him. This would explain why the family was so willing to accept someone who wasn't their son as their lost boy. If it was believed that Nicholas was alive, any murder investigation would come to a halt. Even more interesting, after Bourdain was arrested, police began reopening and investigating the case, and Nicholas's uncle promptly killed himself. Story two. So I have a personal experience, sort of. My father had a coworker who was a great guy, good at his work and fun to talk to, and nobody had any complaints about him. He lived in an apartment right next to work, so the night watchman at the workplace would see him whenever he went out. So one night he went out in his pajamas, talking on his cell phone, and nodded at the watchman. The watchman didn't think much of it, after all. It's not all that weird to take a walk, even though it was quite late. He didn't think much of it. The watchman didn't see him come back, but he figured he missed him when he went on his bathroom break, probably. But the guy didn't show up at work the next day. Someone from work went to check up and he wasn't there. Nothing was disturbed. He was just gone. Everyone thought he had dropped dead, killed by thugs or an accident or some medical condition. The workplace filed a police report. Here's when it gets weird. It turns out that the guy had created a fake identity. Any credentials he had given were fake. The references he had given had never heard of him. The family address he'd given didn't exist. The police didn't find anything illegal in the apartment, but they didn't find anything that would give a clue as to who he was either. We moved away a few years ago, but I don't think the case was ever solved. It's the best unexplained mystery that I've personally come across. To clarify some questions, I don't live in the US and there's no concept of witness protection here that I know of. My father was a pathologist at a women's hospital in a very small town and the guy worked as his technician. He had some experience in the field before he joined. The job also wasn't a well-paid one as many employees would quit quite frequently. Story three, Hauska Castle creeps me out. This Bohemian fortress was constructed on top of an ancient Slavo-Germanic pagan ritual site, which was a very deep hole. Nothing too weird about that, except for the way the castle was built. For one, it's built in a useless position and served no strategic purpose, so it was not desirable for medieval lords of Bohemia or any invaders to control. Then people realized that the castle was inverted. The fortifications were on the inside, arrow slits, turrets, thick fortress walls slanting into the castle, etc. It's as if they were trying to keep something inside. There's a legend that a Bohemian king lowered a prisoner into the hole that the castle was built on, and he began screaming, so they pulled him back up, and he had aged 60 years and died. Then during World War II, the Nazis did occupy the castle for a time, but they reported some strange sounds, 
And when Allied forces stormed the castle, the Nazis were dead or abandoned the place. For sure, there's some folklore involved with the place, but the fact that the castle was built clearly to keep something inside as opposed to out, and even the Nazis had issues with it, definitely makes it seem like some ancient horror lies within that hole. Story four, Rico Harris. He was a massive six, nine inches, former Harlem Globetrotter basketball player who had drug issues earlier in his life, but had made a full recovery and was getting his life back on track. He was driving along California's Interstate Y5 from his home in Southern California to Seattle to live with his girlfriend. He was somewhere just north of Sacramento, exhausted, and told his girlfriend over the phone that he wanted to check out the mountains. All calls stopped since then. His car was found a couple of days later by a patrolman near a rest stop in the mountains. A massive search was launched. No signs of him. The strangest part? A driver later reported seeing a massive six and nine inches individual wandering down the highway just a mile from where the car was found. A week later, a search was relaunched. Massive size 17 footprints were found in the ground that was not there before. They were getting very close and then nothing. No trace, nobody, nothing. Where did Rico go the first time he disappeared? Where was he for an entire week? And where did he disappear to again? The fact that someone could disappear twice is what makes this so damn mystifying to me. Story five, Orange Air. I was visiting friends in Vancouver, Canada in the autumn of 1999. At around 9 p.m., we stepped outside and soon tried to figure out what big bright sign or light was illuminating everything orange. To our amazement, there were no lights of any kind. Then a neighbor came out and asked where the light was coming from. The haze, the fog, the air itself was glowing a greenish orange. Soon others appeared, dog walkers coming back bewildered. We decided to take a walk and sure enough, it was everywhere. We saw another neighbor waving their arms in the air as if it was smoke, but it was just as if the atmosphere, the air itself was simply electrified orange. About an hour later, it wasn't too noticeable anymore, but for what it's worth, the sky, as in looking up to the clouds, was the most astonishing and strange electric blue I have ever seen in my life. Anyways, yes, there were enough reports to a local planetarium that it was mentioned on local radio stations. The experts on hand suggested the only known way this could happen is if some sort of meteor or meteor shower had zoomed through the sky and some sort of glow phenom can happen. However, they emphasized that they had detected no such meteors at all. Nobody else heard or saw anything about meteors from locals either. To this day, I have never heard any kind of explanation. I've never even heard or seen a similar experience. I don't know that I've ever found even a good hypothesis online is going on 20 years of internet accumulation. The whole neighborhood was glowing orange. The air itself was a bright glowing hue, as if a massive orange stage light was being shined from somewhere we couldn't see. Well, for me, that's still the best unsolved mystery. Story six, the disappearance of Ettore Majorana is fascinating. He was a theoretical physicist who was working on neutrino masses in the 20s and 30s and had found a common particle that was present in both regular and dark matter right before he disappeared. From Wikipedia, Majorana disappeared in unknown circumstances during a boat trip from Palermo to Naples on March 25, 1938. Despite several investigations, his fate is still uncertain. His body has not been found. He had withdrawn all of his money from his bank account before making a trip to Palermo. He may have traveled to Palermo hoping to visit his friend, Emilio Segre, a professor at the university there, but Segre was in California at that time. On the day of his disappearance, Majorana sent the following note to Antonio Corelli, director of the Naples Physics Institute. Dear Corelli, I made a decision that has become unavoidable. There isn't a bit of selfishness in it, but I realize what trouble my sudden disappearance will cause you and the students. For this as well, I beg your forgiveness, but especially for betraying the trust, the sincere friendship, and the sympathy you gave me over the past months. I ask you to remember me to all those I learned to know and appreciate in your institute, especially Shuti. I will keep a fond memory of them all at least until 11 p.m. tonight, possibly later too. E. Majorana, 
This was followed rapidly by a telegram canceling his earlier plans. He bought a ticket from Palermo to Naples and was never seen again. His case was then reopened in 2011 when investigators found 10 points of similarity between his face and another photo. The only thing is, this new photo was from 1955 and it looked like Majorana hadn't aged a day. As far as I know, there haven't been any new leads since then. Story seven, it's my favorite because it happened to me. I started a new job a few years ago and one of my first responsibilities was getting the new printer to work. Network printer for our office, run through Google Cloud Print. The printer worked just fine, but sometimes in the morning there would be pictures printed out. Cracked sidewalks, close-ups of fences, feral cats, etc. Just random stuff from around the neighborhood where I work. I tried unplugging the printer for the night. The next morning when I plug it in, it fires up, prints another batch of photos, and continues to work just fine for the rest of the day. We started affectionately calling it the ghost printer. And while it was annoying, it was also a fairly low priority. I had a long-term relationship with the manufacturer's technical support, but no amount of factory resetting and setting it up as a new cloud printer would clear out the ghost. Meanwhile, the ghost had moved on to printing letters with company letterhead, written by a former assistant manager from several years before. After a few months, I downloaded a packet sniffer and started monitoring our network, but no packets were being sent to our printer before a ghost print, despite packets from my and other computers being detectable when they printed to the printer. Eventually, I returned the printer to Amazon, got another one of the same models, and it's worked ghost-free for over a year. The weirdest part is that the assistant manager from 2011, whose letters and photos were being printed in 2016, had died and his widow had been hired by our company the week before I was. Story eight, a couple of weeks ago, I was on a Postmates run with a friend, he's a driver. We get to this apartment complex and see a lady come downstairs with her dog, a cute little thing, I wave high and she just kind of gives me a blank stare. Okay, rude, whatever. We go up to the second floor via the only elevator in the whole complex and deliver the package. And as we're turning back down the hallway we came, we see the same lady and dog come walking towards us. That's weird. We just saw her downstairs a couple of seconds ago. There's either a second elevator in this building, there wasn't, we checked, or she hauled ass upstairs while we were going up via the real elevator. She turns left and disappears. We assume she just went down a second stairway that we didn't see coming up the first time and follow her since we needed to get down anyways and didn't want to take the elevator. Nope, she turned left into a dead end brick wall. She and the dog are nowhere to be found, not on the street outside or in the alley behind the building. What the fuck? We scour the whole building and find out that there's only one stairway on the opposite side of the building and only one elevator the one that we used. So how the fuck did she get up there so quickly? And how did she get down without passing us if she didn't take the elevator and we saw her turn left into a brick wall? Ghosts, that's how. Story nine. My unexplained mystery happened in my university dorm. I was up late since I had no proper sleep schedule. So around 3 a.m. I got a message from my floor's group chat. A girl a few halls over sent out an SOS. She had medical issues and felt like she was going to pass out, but no one in her hall was awake to answer their phone. I couldn't go over there because I didn't have a key, so I sent her a message to let her know I was calling the RA on duty. I called the number and a girl picked up. Her voice was pretty high and I remember thinking she sounded a bit young to be an RA, but I sound like a child on the phone, so I let it be. I didn't recognize the voice, but I don't know every single RA. The way she answered, all drawn out, was a bit off. It was like she didn't know what was going on or what she was doing there. I assumed she had fallen asleep on the job and my call woke her, so I was a little annoyed at that. She began to tell me that I had reached and then trailed off. Trying to speed up the conversation, I kept filling in her blanks like an idiot. After a bit of this, she told me she'd send someone over to check on the girl and now I'm miffed. She's not supposed to send someone. She's supposed to go, it's her job. At this time, I'm about to ask for her name, but she's already hung up. I messaged back to the girl that I'd alerted the RA on duty and someone is coming to help. However, my hall's RA responds to let the girl know she saw her message and is on the way, 
but had never received a call. Now I'm really confused. I cross-check the number and it's correct. I check my call log and the call is there. I text it to ask who I've spoken to, but my RA responds again saying it's still her and she's had the phone since the previous afternoon with no call. We happen to have neighboring rooms, so I would have heard the phone ring. The ringer is required to be on since it's an emergency phone, which I didn't. I asked my friends who were in the room if the girl I spoke to sounded strange, but they claimed they didn't hear anyone at all, even though I keep my call volume up since I'm hard of hearing. My RA messages me the next day to let me know that none of the RA phones ever rang and everyone had a quiet night besides making sure the girl was all right. I still don't know who I spoke to, if it was anyone at all. My roommate believed me at least since a lot of weird things happened in that room, but this was the strangest occurrence. Story 10. This isn't a very famous one, but it's one I've visited at least 10, 15 times. I'd like to begin by saying I do not believe in ghosts, and I do not believe it to be one. However, I can't figure out what in the hell it is. So basically what I'm talking about is only referred to as the ghost light near the Miami University campus. It may have a different reference, but I've never heard one. So there's a whole backstory to why this light appears that I won't bore you with. I've heard different versions of it you know, through the grapevine anyway that always differ in small to big ways. So what you do is go off onto this sort of back road that's hilly and you park at the end of the street where it takes a sharp right around next to this house where the supposed incident that caused this to happen every night took place. And supposedly there's only one light on in this house at night, and that's the bedroom. And oddly enough, every time I went, it was the only light on. Same bedroom every time. But that's not the light I'm talking about. But it was odd or coincidental that the bedroom light was the only one on every single time, because it does have to be at nighttime to see it. Anyway, you go down a hilly road, it's about a mile long, and you turn around when you reach the turn and come back and park facing the road you just traveled down. You are now supposed to flash your lights to get this to happen. We did the first few times, then we realized we didn't need to do that. It would happen no matter. What happens next is off down in the distance, you see what looks to be a motorcycle front light coming down the road. It's far off at first and kind of disappears and reappears. Following the hills, then it gets closer and bigger. And then it's a light from something and it's following down the road coming at you it's really weird and when it gets to the closest uphill to you it dips down the hill and disappears it gets close enough to freak you out a few times a red light appears and goes away from you yes like a brake light it's harder to see usually and doesn't always seem to appear it may not sound exciting to some but in the dark on a road with no one on it it makes it pretty scary especially if there are only two of you I've also gone with groups before and lined the road with people. People along the road didn't see anything. I also drove myself and a girl straight at it. We went over the hill as the light came from the opposite side, and we could see it, and we drove over the hill half expecting to hit it. But we didn't, and when we passed where it would have been and turned around, we saw nothing. I haven't looked into it in many years. But there were a few YouTube videos on it. And the picture quality was always so terrible you are just listening to people react to it. But you should check out a couple anyway. You may be able to make a little blob on a black screen. But the people's reactions are always cool. They are blown away every time. I'm going to go see now if there are any better ones.